Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Anna Lemke, psychiatrist, author, Stanford University professor, and all-around expert in addiction medicine. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So you are going to be doing a, a keynote presentation in about an hour here at uh, the conference in Las Vegas. What are you going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about sort of how we got here and then where we are now and how to move forward. So sort of a historical overview, um, you know, what happened, what are the complex forces inside and outside of medicine that drove over-prescribing of opioids that led to the current day epidemic, how prescribing has changed, especially since 2012 when it peaked, um, it's gone down since then, which is generally good news, although the way that it's gone down ha is also uh, potentially problematic. And then just talking about m more of what we need to do going forward. You've identified three uh, factors within healthcare that were pretty much responsible for the epidemic. Could you just kind of talk about those a little bit? Well, uh, I mean, I think one thing to really, you know, make very clear is that it's a complex, multi-layered phenomenon, and there were many different contributors. But what I talk about is kind of the invisible forces inside of medicine that, that drive opioid overprescribing. The first one is just the role of the opioid pharmaceutical industry and how they really infiltrated medicine Trojan horse style to convince doctors that opioid prescribing is founded in good evidence when in fact there's no reliable evidence that opioids are good treatment for chronic pain. Opioids work very well short term for acute pain, but they're definitely not the treatment of choice long term for many different reasons. And yet the pharmaceutical industry was able to really convince a whole generation of healthcare providers, myself included, that opioid prescribing was the way to go, that you could use opioids indiscriminately for minor and chronic pain conditions without running into trouble. And of course, you know, we are living the results of, of that kind of misinformation. Mm -hmm. The second invisible force that I talk about is what I call the Toyotaization of medicine. And by that I mean the way that healthcare has really transformed in the last 30 years such that most healthcare providers are now salaried employees within large integrated healthcare settings. And as such, we, um, there are a lot of pressures on us to practice medicine in a certain kind of way. Um, and um, I outlined something I call the P paradigm. There's enormous pressure now on doctors to please patients, um, to make sure that they're satisfied customers, um, to uh, make sure that we prescribe pills and perform procedures because that's what insurance companies will reimburse. They don't reimburse spending time with patients, educating patients, building that therapeutic alliance. Um, there's enormous pressure and has been historically since the 90s to palliate pain, to make sure we do everything in our power you know, to, to get this patient out of pain or even get a patient down to zero pain, which is obviously not a realistic goal for many of our patients. So that's a second kind of force. The third, uh, the third force that I talk about is something that I call the medicalization of poverty. Um, and by that, I just mean the ways in which, um, again, over about the last 30 to 50 years, um, patients really, there's a subset of patients who now has adopted the sick role as a way to pay their bills. So disability, um, Medicaid, um, other forms of disability um, have kind of replaced welfare. And this is a very controversial topic and you know not very politically correct to talk about, but there, there's good evidence to show um, that um, the way that we prescribe opioids to poor people is different than the way that we prescribe opioids to other people, namely we prescribe more opioids. Um, you know, that's sometimes because uh, we just are desperate to do anything for them and we don't really have the tools in place to help them with their socioeconomic and psychospiritual problems, so we're just left with the pills. Um, but the result is really that you've got people who literally cannot afford to get well. And so it's kind of this vicious cycle where participating in the healthcare system has generated kind of a, a cohort 
of disability patients who are being harmed by the ongoing opioid prescription um, and yet can't disentangle themselves from that role for, for financial reasons. So, and then, and then the uh, uh, final invisible force that I, that I talk about is just our conceptualization of pain in modern medicine. Today we think of pain as dangerous. We think that doctors have a moral responsibility to eliminate all pain. Uh, we have this idea that if we don't eliminate pain immediately, um, we're going to leave some kind of psychic scar that sets that patient up for pain in the future either in the form of post-traumatic stress disorder or something called centralizing pain syndromes. And what I like to emphasize is that whatever you may think of that phenomenon, it's, it's really important to note that it's a very modern conception of pain. 150 years ago, doctors actually believed that pain was salutary, that it was good for patients. They believed that it boosted the immune response, that it boosted, boosted the cardiovascular response. There was this idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, that there were sp spiritual benefits. So we don't, we don't think like that anymore. We, we very much have this idea that pain is bad and you know, eliminate all pain. And I think that that has also driven uh, the opioid overprescribing problem. What's your opinion on pain? Well, yeah, nobody's ever asked me that. Interesting. So yeah, and, and I'm, I'm working on another project that's related to it. So, you know, I think that there's, there's healthy pain and that's really actually good for us. And then there's the type of pain that um, you know is just horrific, and and um, that we wouldn't want anybody to suffer. But even in the cases where you know there's horrific, you know, debilitating, just intolerable pain, the truth of the matter is that opioids are not the solution to that problem. And so that's the key message. It's not that you know, let's let people suffer. Not at all, my goodness, if I had something to help people with horrific chronic pain, I mean, I would be the first person to try to help them. But, but the, the myth that we've all been operating under is that opioids are the solution to that problem and, and they're not and they can make pain worse and also lead to all kinds of other problems from addiction to accidental overdose death to even more mundane but serious problems like constipation, severe debilitating constipation, hormonal imbalances, decreased testosterone, um, cardiac problems, bone problems, depression, um, cognitive problems. So, so lots and lots of problems with, with taking opioids long term. Another kind of a hidden and not that well appreciated problem with opioids is just the phenomenon of physical dependence, right? Anybody who takes an opioid every day for a long period of time is going to get physically dependent on them and then really potentially have a lot of difficulty withdrawing from that opioid. And that doesn't mean they're addicted, um, but physical dependence is its own kind of morbidity. One of the projects that I've been working on in the last couple of years is teaching docs actually how to taper patients off of chronic opioid therapy because what we've seen is that as you know prescribers are now running scared from both opioid prescribing and and from pain patients is that they're just cutting folks off and of course that is not not the way to do things what we need to do is have you know compassionate and very slow tapers for for most of these people what do you think the role of cbd is in in a, as an alternative uh-huh well, you know, CBD, uh, as you know, is, um, is thought to be a non-addictive um, um, sort of ingredient in the cannabis plant. And to date, there's not a whole lot of robust evidence that it actually does much of anything, either for pain or for other conditions. Um, there may be some, you know, some, um, some, some seizure disorders where, where it has some benefit. So I'm not saying that CBD doesn't work. I'm just saying there's not a lot of evidence to date. Um, so what I tell my patients is that if you're sure it's just pure CBD, I don't think there's any harm in trying it. But if there's THC in there, they need to be careful uh, because the truth is it's very difficult to separate CBD and THC apart. And so many times when people are buying what they think is pure CBD, there's actually THC in it. And THC is addictive. Um, and THC also, we know that works for pain. So there, there's, good, there's good evidence for that. But just like opioids, if you take the THC you know, or the cannabis plant daily for an extended period of time, 
it will stop working, you will develop tolerance, and there is some uh, withdrawal phenomenon. Hmm. Okay. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, you said you had some personal experience as a, as a practitioner with uh, prescribing opioids. Mm -hmm. um, is that what kind of led you to start to study this more? What, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that story? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what really, so first of all, I, when I went to medical school, I learned almost nothing about addiction or how to treat it. And then I did my psychiatry residency. And likewise, even in my psychiatry residency, I had very limited, limited training in addiction. So when I started out as an early career physician, I, I did not want to treat patients with addiction. I also had, you know, some negative countertransference. I didn't think it was a disease, all, all of that stuff that's kind of, you know, pervasive in medicine even today, although it's fortunately changing. Um, but what happened was that I began to realize that my patients, in fact, who were coming in for depression and anxiety had significant substance use problems, and in not asking them about it, I was really not helping them. Um, so that was a, that began a process of re-education for me, learning about addiction, how to treat it, how to, how to help these patients. And what I discovered is that my patients got a whole lot better, a whole lot faster, when I also paid attention to their substance use problems in addition to their anxiety and depression. And I, and I treated those things in an integrated manner. So that was um, basically the early 2000s. Then about the mid-2000s, I started seeing more and more patients who were struggling with prescription drug misuse and addiction, benzodiazepines, stimulants, opioids. And that's really what got me then motivated you know, to try to educate other physicians, to educate patients, to warn patients about the addictive potential of these medicines even if they were taking them, you know, as prescribed by a doctor. So, you know, one of the myths that's pervasive in medicine is that as long as you have real pain and you're getting your opioids from a doctor, you can't get addicted. And we know that's not true. About one in four pain patients who gets their opioids from a doctor will actually develop an opioid use disorder of some sort. And the same is true, by the way, for benzodiazepines, for stimulants. Even if you have real ADHD, if you're getting uh, prescribed a stimulant, you know, you're at increased risk uh, for getting addicted to that sim stimulant just simply because of being exposed to it. The same thing with benzodiazepines. You can have bona fide panic disorder, but if you get Xanax and you take it for, for a long, prolonged period of time, that, that exposure has the potential to, um, you know, to, to lead to addiction problems. Mm. Okay. So you're an author. Yes. Can you tell us about your most recent book? Well, my book is called Drug Dealer MD, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients Got Hooked, and Why It's So Hard to Stop. And it is basically um, uh, the kind of the story of, of the opioid epidemic from inside medicine. Why is it that, you know, well-educated, well-intentioned prescribers ended up doing, practicing in a way that harmed patients. And so I go through kind of all of the contributors, and there are so many, it's such a complex problem, which is why it's also so hard to solve. Mm -hmm. um, there's the just the simple problem of addiction and how reinforcing the pills are. There are all those incentives inside of and outside of medicine for, for, for prescribers to write more prescriptions, to get patients you know, in and out quickly, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So as you're talking to our uh, several thousand uh, anti-aging practitioners here today, what do you hope that the main takeaway is for that group? Well, I hope that um, the learners today really leave with a deep understanding of um, the fact that um, opioids are not good treatment for chronic pain and that exposure itself, even um, when prescribed by, you know, a healthcare provider can lead to serious problems, especially in that vul vulnerable subset of patients. Um, I also hope that, that learners will come away with a sort of a better understanding of sort of what is addiction and how it changes the brain and how when people go outside their moral compass to get drugs, um, you know, it's really because they're driven by this disease of addiction, not because they're bad people. Um, and you know, in my experience is that people with addiction are actually wonderful people and they do get better. So that's another myth um, that I'd like to sort of push up against is that you know, it's hopeless and people with addiction never get better. That's not true, they, they get better and treatment is one of the paths to recovery. 
The other thing that I, I hope I leave learners with is just an awareness of how easily we as well-intentioned healthcare providers are influenced by these external forces, you know, including the pharmaceutical industry, and how that kind of messaging really can influence our prescribing, and we need to be really careful and thoughtful about what indeed is um, evidence-based care. Your work has led to consulting policymakers and legislators across the nation. What, if any, role do you believe everyday medical practitioners should have in policymaking decisions, both locally and nationally? Yeah, I love that question because when I first started out in medicine, I was like, nose to the grindstone, I just need to take care of patients, one patient at a time, it's all good. I really wasn't interested in policy or being a public person in any way, but what I discovered is that that's no longer possible. Uh, in, you know, as, a, as a healthcare practitioner today, we have to raise our voices and we actually have to fight back against an increasingly um, directive healthcare system where we, we are losing our voice. Um, so I become a, a huge proponent of healthcare providers, you know, speaking up and joining together and, you know, using their expertise because really at the end of the day, you know, a non-healthcare a non provider who's not in the room with patients is, is not really ever going to understand what, you know, what the systems, are, you know, are how they're impacting the care that we provide. So we have to participate in that dialogue. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you for that, and thank yeah. you for joining us today yeah. with the podcast. My pleasure.